Well, this is a question that occurred to me recently, and I thought that this might be of some interest to you, because uh, Wittgenstein, after all, is uh, one of the most famous INFJs, at least, you know, people recognized as an INFJ by the majority of the population. Uh, I do myself consider that he was an INFJ. He fits the type really well. But nevertheless, he is kind of an oddball in many ways, much more eccentric and confrontational than we might usually describe an INFJ. I mean, eccentric, of course, all INFJs are eccentric, but openly eccentric, confrontationally eccentric. And um, I thought that for this reason, it might be interesting to try to figure out what subtype or subcategory of INFJ does he belong to in the, termino in the terminology of the infinite soul? Right? This book is by INFJ Life of the Modern World, because this book says essentially there's, you could say that there are three big families of INFJs, right? Families is a better word than uh, subtype. I think it was uh, a user, uh, Power Red Bull, who was commenting on the fact that if their subtypes are they static, and I'm saying it's more about life choices, and I prefer talking about family resemblance between life choices. But this book talks about, this is my new book on the INFJ, by the way, The Infinite Soul, you can get it, sequel to The Ecstatic Soul, which maybe you already got. If you haven't, you can still get it. All the links are below. But there are three subtypes, and or like I said, families, or three, you know, branches within the family. The adaptive INFJ, which I also call the adaptive submissive. I've discussed, I've discussed this type fairly recently. The solipsist, which I've discussed even more because there were controversies as to whether uh, the solipsistic INFJ might not be a perfectly valid INFJ that does not need to be surpassed. Even though the argument in the infinite soul is that the spiritualized INFJ or the liberated INFJ, these two are synonyms, was kind of the last Hegelian stage of development of an INFJ life, hence the focus on life in this book. But it's about life choices. It's not so much about what your hardware is made of. We have this kind of hardware. What kind of choices are you going to make? This book d discusses that a great deal. Um, where does Wittgenstein fit in all this? Um, I think that we can, It's you, 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 you'll see, it's quite interesting because as usual with Wittgenstein, it's not easy to place him. Uh, so he's faithful to his reputation, even in this regard, even in the terms, in the language game of the infinite soul, which is itself, I should add, permeated with Wittgensteinian influence for those who are able to recognize it if they read this book. Wittgenstein is a big influence on my thinking, uh, probably the main philosophical influences on my thinking with Martin Heidegger, who is another interesting case where INFJ could be pro proposed, even though INTJ is a, is a very strong competitor. In any case, Wittgenstein is clearly not adaptive submissive. I think we can agree on this without hesitation. The simple reason being that he was so confrontational. Uh, he was so, um, uh, in, you know, intense. He was not peaceable. He was not willing to make compromises. So he was the exact opposite of what we picture an, adapt an adaptive submissive. INFJ to be. So it can be fairly confidently and quickly said that hypothesis that INFJ, that Wittgenstein was an adaptive INFJ, just forget about it. It's very tempting to see in Wittgenstein a solipsist because again, he's extremely attached to a particular vision of things. He does switch between the Tractatus, the first book, and the, log and the Philosophical Investigations, the second book. Um, but even though he switches, there's a switch in vision, he still remains very, very immersed in his worldview to the exclusion of competing worldviews. You have to admit that, you know, um, Wittgenstein, from what we know of him, was not the best at debating with other people. He'd get angry, confrontational again, and often dismiss others as kind of being stupid, you know. Um, even Bertrand Russell found it notoriously difficult to, to reason with him, where, you know, there's a famous, uh, famous diary entry from Bertrand Russell's notebook where Russell says, this German is really tiring me. He won't admit, he won't admit that there is no elephant in the room. <laughs> you know? So uh, in a literal sense, Wittgenstein very, very attached to his worldview. And again, the confrontational side, the tendency to contrast with what's not part of the self-contained environment, that's all very Wittgensteinian in many ways. And yet I want to argue 
I want to argue that Wittgenstein in his life is poised between solipsism, stage number two, and spiritualized, spirit, the spiritualized or the liberated energy. He was on the path to liberation. And I think that's why, um, if you read his works closely, you do have, you have all the solipsistic stuff, but there's always appreciation about the mystical. There's always a sense that eternity means more than just mere timelessness that God is something meaningful, that there is something ineffable about reality, that there is a strong mystical resonance in his works. He's not quite, you know, basically his point is almost that the domain of the sacred, the domain of the spiritual, does not belong to language, that in our propositions of language, we're bound to speak in the language of materialism, in a sense, to say meaningful things, and that's, there are things that are meaningful beyond just these, but they cannot be put in language. They exceed language. But the fact they exceed language does not mean that they are non-existent. It's something that really becomes more and more apparent as he progresses through life. And it's interesting that at the end of his life, indeed, you know, he, he one of his last words you know, to the people who were attending him in his sickbed was to say, as the legend goes, tell them I've had a wonderful life. And I, you don't really picture necessarily a solipsist saying this kind of thing on their deathbed. I think that Wittgenstein was, if not completely spiritualized, because he was still very confrontational, he was still very, uh, he was still very angry in some respects, and you know, he, he, he was uh, so intense. Uh, he clearly saw that there was a path beyond mere solipsism and in fact there's so much more to say about him but i'm kind of curious to know what you think if you are familiar with wittgenstein what are your thoughts do you think he's a solipsist or do you think he is a spiritualized dying ahead of his time perhaps but please let me know don't forget that i can get my two books the sequel the prequel and on patreon thank you so much to my new supporters who've been heeding my call saying, you know, I can really use a bit of your support. There's been some more support. You can interact with me on Patreon anywhere from three euros a month. That brings super great uh, help to, you know, to the channel to keep things going because I, that really helps me. So please, you know, consider clicking the link to Patreon below. Okay, see you soon guys, take care.